finish our first period looking at this slide, which is an example of vegetative valvular endocarditis in the bird. And in the, just as in the pig, the causative agent can be erysipelaprex rhizopathia, or it can be streptococcus. In this case, it's a turkey, and in turkeys, it's more likely to be erysipelaprex. The feathers have been picked off of this bird. This is an example of feather picking. It's due to a deficiency of essential amino acids. Cysteine, methionine are the two that are usually deficient in the ration. The birds, because of their deficiency, eat the feathers to make up for the amino acid deficiency. Whenever they clean up all the loose feathers in the house, they begin to pick feathers off of each other. Eventually, they can pick so deeply that they begin to cause wounds, and when that happens, we have cannibalism problems. Appropriately called a turkey cowboy. <laughs> and I, I, I have difficulty. I think this is a varus anomaly. Am I correct on that? When they come together? Valgus is when they go out? Okay. Cowboy is the common name, and a varus anomaly would be the, uh, or deviation, or malformation, or something would be. This. Whenever this uh, condition occurs, the center of gravity of the bird changes, and it can get so severe that the only way the bird can balance itself is simply by putting one foot on top of the other. I've even seen them so bad they have to cross their feet to maintain balance. The posture of this bird is abnormal. The back is arched, and the bird is tipped forward. In the larger growing turkeys, locomotor disturbances constitute the greatest cause of economic loss. Most of the disease problems in the older birds are associated with some problems in the musculoskeletal system. The cause of, or one cause, of this uh, varus deformity of the limb is tibial dyschondroplasia. To orient you to the slide, we're looking here at the proximal portions of two tibias. The one on the left is normal for comparison purposes. The one on the right contains a large mass of cartilage, which extends down into the medullary cavity from the growth plate. The, there's an area of hemorrhage along one side. There's lytic areas along the other side. And there's a green discoloration of this cartilage, which indicates there's been some hemorrhage into the cartilage itself. The cause of this problem is unknown. A bird with bilateral tibial dyschondroplasia. The lesion located here and here. This is a systemic problem. Many, many growth zones are affected. However, the greatest clinical significance occurs when the problem develops in the proximal tibia. And that's a site that we generally always examine in meat-type birds for uh, tibial dyschondroplasia. The significance of mild dyschondroplasia is a point of controversy in the poultry industry and amongst poultry pathologists. You'll see here three examples, and these two here are clearly associated with old hemorrhage. You've got areas of discoloration. This one is a little less clear. All three of these turkeys were lame. They had deformity of the limbs. The only thing that could be found in those were these moderate to mild lesions of tibial dyschondroplasia. A red herring, as far as musculoskeletal diseases is concerned, is scoliosis. Scoliosis is a relatively common change that's found in the spine of meat-type birds, both broilers and turkeys. This is an example of a mildly affected bird. This is an example of a moderately affected bird. And this is an example of a severely affected bird. None of these birds were lame. Scoliosis does not cause clinical lameness. Now the bird, particularly this last one, was all twisted up and about three inches shorter than what it should have been, but it wasn't lame. I think there's a potential opportunity for those of you with a research inclination to perhaps look at this scoliotic problem in, in meat-type birds 
as uh, perhaps having some similarity to scoliosis that occurs in adolescent females. Another bird, clinical appearance, humped up back, sitting down on its hocks, stimulate this bird a little bit, and you get a characteristic clinical attitude. Again, you see the arched back, the wings are being used for balance, the head is thrust forward, the legs are, are cocked upward, the bird cannot get up, cannot stand. This is the typical clinical appearance of a bird with spondylolithesis. Spondylolithesis, or as it's commonly known, kinky back. An example of a mildly affected bird and a severely affected bird are presented in this slide. And you can see in the lower uh, specimen, the characteristic lesion, the anterior portion is to the right, the caudal portion is to the left. And just by way of anatomical review, what sits in this open space in the fused lumbar vertebra? The glycogen body, yes, very good. You'll notice here that there's a sharp angulation upward of, and I, I, get, I get my vertebra all mixed up, but uh, uh, I think this is T6. This causes an abnormal deviation of T7, and for the life of me, I can't see why we, sh we couldn't call that right there a hemivertebra, if we use our knowledge of other species. But anyway, that term has not been used in the literature. And then to get the spine back into a reasonable, normal configuration, it comes back down again, and it results then in the caudal portion of T7 being thrust up into the vertebral canal and putting pressure on the spinal cord. This then results in the lameness and the characteristic clinical appearance that we saw in the previous slide. Spondylolithesis, or kinky back, in the meat type bird. A slide which will require some orientation we're looking here, the bird's body is to the left, the leg is going out to the right. I would suspect that the bird's head is down this direction, but it's immaterial to us because what we're supposed to be looking at is the femoral head, and the femoral head obviously is not there. This is uh, femoral head necrosis, femoral head necrosis. Most cases, it's aseptic, but in some instances, it's part of the osteomyelitis, discospondylitis complex, which we're going to get into in a moment. It's caused by either staph staphylococcus or uh, certain strains of E. coli. And this is the femur, the femoral head that's been popped out of the acetabulum, and it's not there. It's been replaced by a caseous mass of exudate. Another example, here's the acetabulum, the femur, and the femoral head, and we can see here the beginning of a false joint development, pseudoarthrosis. Need uh, the next one. We're still on turkeys. We've got chickens to go and other things. Okay. I mentioned to you earlier that we have a variety of infectious diseases, respiratory diseases, septicemic conditions, notably E. coli in the young turkey and fowl cholera in the older turkey. All of these then may clear from the body proper but remain localized in joints, may uh, get the eye, we'll see perhaps a case of meningitis a little bit later on, but one place where they oftentimes locate is in the bone and they cause an osteomyelitis. Again, a site for this, a common site, is the proximal portion of the medial tibia. There actually, in fact, it's a tibial tarsal bone, but we'll call it tibia for purposes here. And we can see a lytic area filled with purulent exudate. E. coli is most commonly recovered from these, staphylococcus uh, less commonly. And then there's a whole host of other organisms which would probably be recovered less than 1% of the time. A severe example of osteomyelitis, proximal tibia, which is normal on the right, severely affected bird on the left. I don't think it takes any stretch of the imagination to see why this bird was lame. The whole articular surface is collapsed into the lesion, uh, the area of, of uh, necrosis. This is a variation on that same process. This is discospondylitis. 
in birds, the only, only uh, vertebrae that articulate are the cervical vertebrae, the last two thoracic and first lumbar vertebra, and then the coccygeal vertebra. Everything else is fused. And in those articulating vertebra, in T6, T7, and L1, is where we see lesions in the spine. That's where uh, spondylolisthesis occurs. It's also where discospondylitis occurs. In this particular bird, the head is up here, the tail is down here. We can see a swelling in the articulating uh, space between, I presume this probably T6 up here, T7 is in here, and L1 is back in here. Maybe this is L1 down here. Fixed specimens of the lesion and cross-section. The disc used to be right in here. It's almost uh, completely gone. Here's another example. We have a sp uh, spondylitis in both instances, and we have involvement of both the anterior and posterior vertebra. This whole process then has protruded dorsally again and put pressure on the spinal cord, which has caused the bird's lameness. These are infectious, and they are relatively common. I think you could go into virtually any turkey flock and look at their lame birds, and before you got through 10 of them, you'd find at least one example of this condition. Breast blister or sternal bursitis is illustrated in this slide. The skin has been reflected. The bird's head is to the right. We see the pectoral muscles and the keel bone. There is a bursa, which normally is inapparent to us, but this one has been, uh, is markedly thickened. It's opened. We can see laminar caseus exudate in there and also considerable abundance of fluid. Sternal bursitis may result from just sheer pressure. The bird's being down on the breast for an extended period of time. We see this typically in birds with leg problems or locomotor disturbances. Or it can be to, due to infectious agents which have an affinity for synovia. This would be things like rheoviruses, mycoplasmas, some of the bacteria that uh, may be involved. So it can be either specific or nonspecific. Clinical appearance of a turkey which is having some respiratory problems. This bird is a market weight tom turkey. It's being loaded onto the truck. That's the reason for the snow fence back here to guide the bird up to the truck. See a normal turkey, nice pink head, no mouth breathing. Normal turkey, nice pink head, no mouth breathing. We here see here a sad turkey, mouth breathing, cyanosis, and he just looks a little beat up. That turkey will probably not make it to the truck. If he does make it to the truck, he won't make it to the processing plant. The reason is, illustrated in this slide, aspergillosis. Aspergillosis, pulmonary form of aspergillosis. The lesions here, thick, heavy capsule by this time because they've been developing for several weeks now. And if there's air, the fungus will actually <coughs> produce fruiting bodies and spores right in those air spaces. Tracheal aspergillosis can also cause suffocation, mortality in birds. Here's uh, the bird's back end is down this way. The head is to the lower left. The uh, lesion is right at the thoracic inlet. We can see the bifurcation of the main bronchi. The syrinx would be right in here. They have a small area of exudate attached to the surface of the syrinx as well. This is tracheal aspergillosis. Another example of aspergillosis. And this time, here's the heart, pericardial sac. The bird's head is to the left. Here's the liver, the proventriculus, the ventriculus. You can see the uh, intestines, the abdominal air sac is spread out. We have some little caseous masses, a considerable amount of frothy uh, exudation there. And then right at this recurrent bronchus, this is a prime site for the development of these aspergillus lesions, are the recurrent bronchi, is this plaque. And on this plaque is a small fuzzy gray area. This is the fungus actually growing and producing spores and fruiting bodies right on the surface of the lesion. A repeat of what we just saw, a little bit different variation. Here's the liver here. The ribs are coming right down along here. Uh, they've been cut and reflected back. We're looking right into the recurrent bronchus of the lung, into the cranial thoracic air sac. And here is our aspergillus lesion, again with fungus visibly present on the surface of the lesion. 
little bit of a scraping there, make a wet smear out of it, and you could, could easily confirm your diagnosis. Very typical lesion. A dermatitis affecting a, a processed turkey, in fact, a flock of processed turkeys. The lesions were located around the vent, down over the thigh, and uh, along the back portion of the bird. No lesions were found in front of the legs. This is a dermatitis which has resulted from foul mite infestation. Dermatitis, foul mite infestation. Abnormal eggs, I don't know whether one would call this a gross lesion or not. <laughs> it's just weirdo eggs. Uh, three viruses that will cause this, and it's associated with severe drops in egg production. Number one is Newcastle disease virus. Number two is paramyxovirus. Other paramyxoviruses, I should say, since Newcastle is one. And thirdly is influenza virus. Abnormal eggs, wrinkled shells. They'd be great for Easter, wouldn't they? <laughs> Something different. A tumor condition caused by a virus in uh, breeder turkeys. It's fortunately rare in this country, but sporadic cases are seen. The spleen is enlarged. The reason that you can tell the spleen is enlarged and a, a helpful hint to you in evaluating slides on uh, poultry, the spleen should be about a third to a half the size of the proventriculus. You can see this one here is clearly as big or perhaps even slightly larger than the proventriculus. In addition, it has these diffuse yellow-gray areas in it. We look over at the liver and we can see the same type of a, of a change. The liver appears to be enlarged. Certainly the border is very, very rounded um, at this particular, along this particular border. And the material in here is uh, very irregular in size, very diffuse, and it would appear that it's more or less just growing and proliferating in the liver, which indeed it is. This is reticuloendotheliosis. It's caused by a type C retrovirus. Reticuloendotheliosis caused by a type C retrovirus. Another example, a more solitary tumor, but again, the diffuse tumor infiltration in the spleen and uh, liver. Here's the pancreas, involvement of uh, the pancreas, slightly more large, or slightly larger nodular tumors. We can even begin to pick up a few little tumor foci here on the serosa of the duodenum. The common name for that condition is turkey leukosis. Turkey leukosis. Raised wart-like lesions on the unfeathered areas of chickens and turkeys are characteristic of pox. This, in fact, would be turkey pox. Turkey pox, pox viruses in birds occur in two forms, the wet form, the dry form. I suppose to be absolutely correct, you should indicate here dry form of turkey pox. Here you would indicate wet form of turkey pox, if you knew that was a turkey, which you can't tell from the slide, but in the history would tell you. The caseous pseudomembranes occur. Another chronic or long-term, I shouldn't say chronic, it's a long-term lesion of pox. You have these small tumor-like nodules, one on the caudal portion of the larynx, one down here in the esophagus and went all the way down into the crop here on the, the uh, palate. Pox lesions are proliferative lesions. So whenever you have proliferative lesions in the upper uh, portions of the digestive system or respiratory tract or on the skin, please think in terms of pox virus infection. Here's a crop similar to what we saw earlier. However, if you palpated this one, it would be full of fluid and liquid. This is pendulous crop, pendulous crop. It would be easy to, to distinguish pendulous crop from impacted crop if you could actually see it and feel it, but with the slides, of course, we can't do that. 
We're going to move then on to chickens, again, starting day one, going right up through the life of the birds. Here's four baby chicks that have died. And the characteristic thing that we find is that the yolk sacs are full of an odorous fluid, tends to be kind of a greenish to a brownish color, and this is mushy chick disease, mushy chick disease. It's basically an omphalitis. Uh, we recover proteus, E. coli, all kinds of organisms that are, are commonly found in the environment from these uh, yolk sacs. Ammonia, ammonia, acute conjunctivitis due to high ammonia levels in the house. Another example, a little bit older chicken. You can see a little frothy material here. It's mouth breathing. Ammonia. We're back to rickets again now. Bird's growing up a little bit. This happened to be classical rickets. This guy thought that his birds didn't need chicken feed. All they needed was corn. <laughs> and all they needed was corn but to live, but not to keep from turning to rubber chickies. <laughs> <laughs> you see here? These things were fun to play with. <laughs> you just bounce them all over the place. The same types of changes that we saw, rickets and turkeys, we also see in chickens for the very same reasons. Here's an example showing these deformed ribs, massive thickening of the ribs, quite characteristic. Parathyroid hyperplasia, people ask me, well, how do you know that that's a hyperthyroid or hyperplastic parathyroid? I said, well, we can see it. <laughs> so if you can find a bird's parathyroid, it's probably hyperplastic. Actually, this thing measures out about two millimeters, which is gigantic for a parathyroid. Oh, uh, let me just digress here. Uh, this is the thyroid, and we're located at the thoracic inlet. I do not have a slide to show you, but there's a common disease in parakeets called thyroid dysplasia, or it's also commonly called goiter, where the thyroid enlarges in the thoracic inlet and then causes pressure on the esophagus and trachea, and it may, in fact, even be fatal. The bird's thyroid is not located up behind the ma uh, mandible as it is in, in uh, or just behind the larynx as it is in mammals. It's much lower down. Nervous signs in some young chickens. Necropsy of the birds reveal hemorrhages, swelling. They've got an area of pallor here in this cone cerebellum. This is encephalomalacia. The lesions are not as severe in chickens as they are in turkeys. I'm not sure exactly what the reason is for that, but you, you see less severe changes in chickens. The clinically, it, it's just as severe. Here's a bird that we artificially kept alive by gavaging it for three days. And these swollen areas now have shrunken down, and they're actually areas of sclerosis. Sclerosis. This is the gross appearance of the sclerotic form of encephalomalacia the sclerotic form of encephalomalacia. It's just, in fact, the resolution of the lesion. If you ever wanted to see astrogliosis, astrocytosis, take a look at some of these avian cerebellums. It's just absolutely beautiful. Makes your eyes pop out. Vitamin A deficiency. In this slide, we see the esophagus, which has been opened up. The trachea is here. Uh, again, these birds were malnourished. They were on an improper ration. And in the esophagus, there are small white raised nodules. These are described in the literature as pustules. Microscopically, they are the esophageal glands that are filled with keratin because of metaplasia of the glands. So there are metaplastic esophageal glands. There is some inflammatory reaction to most of these, but in my mind, it's not truly a pustule or an abscess, per se. More or less a, a plug gland. I put this slide in here to demonstrate to you one of the hazards of poultry pathology, and that you can lacerate your hand on the keel of these very emaciated birds. It's just severe emaciation, opening this bird up, 
We see a markedly enlarged duodenum. It has a pearl gray color. This is coccidiosis due to Imeria acervulina. We're gonna look at three different types of coccidiosis in chickens. This is Imeria acervulina. It occurs in layers. The birds are, are severely emaciated and the lesion is located in the duodenum. A close look at this again shows us a catarrhal type of change in the mucosa and we should be able to make out some small, barely distinct white areas through the serosa, but they do not show up in this slide at all. They do not show up, I apologize for that. They're difficult to photograph because they're, they're relatively subtle changes. It's I Imeria acervulina. There's another case of coccidiosis. In this instance, the mid-jejunum is uh, tremendously distended and we have small red spots visible through the serosal surface all throughout the affected portion of the jejunum. Upon opening the intestine, you can see some small pale spots. These are actually colonies of the coccidia. And then we see a great deal of hemorrhage, a great deal of hemorrhage. This is coccidiosis caused by Imeria nicatrix. Coccidiosis caused by Imeria nicatrix. Lesions in the jejunum and hemorrhage into the lumen of the gut. The third type of coccidiosis, there are nine species, but we're just going to talk about three because they're the most pathogenic. The third type that we're going to look at is cecal coccidiosis caused by Imeria tonella. We have here a range of lesions produced by Imeria tonella. All of them uh, occur in the cecum. Here's a cecum that is distended and markedly hemorrhagic. Here's a cecum which is distended and has some caseous material in it. We can see that through the serosal surface. And then here's one that just has some uh, small hemorrhages visible through the serosal surface. Opening these cecum up, see that the top ones are basically just filled with unclotted blood. We have a fibrinohemorrhagic membrane which lines the ceca of, cecum of the intermediate one. And then we have a fibrinous membrane which is uh, lining the mucosa of the cecum of the lower lower bird. This demonstrates for us, depicts the range of lesions that we see with Imeria tonella. How do you remember these three pathogenic coccidian birds? If you take the first initial of the species name, A-N-T, it gives you ant. From anterior to posterior is A. servulina nicatrix tonella. If you win a trivia contest on that, I'd like to split the winnings with you. <laughs> we generally associate cecal coccidiosis with young birds. However, if birds are raised in an environment where the organism is not present and then put into a contaminated environment, you can see the disease at any age. In this particular laying hen, which was in production, we note generalized pallor to the tissues and the cecal are extended and markedly hemorrhagic. This is cecal coccidiosis in a layer. Back to our very young birds. We have uh, in this particular bird, I'm sorry, it's upside down. The lung here has been dissected free of the thoracic wall. We can see small gray nodules, again, surrounded by a small narrow zone of uh, dark red. This is aspergillosis. And the specific form of aspergillosis is brooder pneumonia. That is correct. A more advanced stage of brooder pneumonia. For some, some reason, this bird was able to survive for an extended period of time. The lesions have become much more prominent in the lungs but they're still nodular, presenting to us as either a tumor or a granuloma. Look at the adrenal glands. Has this bird been under stress or has this bird been under stress? Whew, those are really biggies. And our kidneys then are showing the typical uh, appearance of a toxic nephrosis. They're pale, they're swollen, and the tubules are clearly evident, as well as in this case, we had excess urates. 
filling the ureters. Bruder pneumonia. This is ocular aspergillosis. Ocular aspergillosis. There's no way that you could tell this from some other form of keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis in a young chicken. Uh, it could be due to an injury. It could be due to a, a foreign body. Um, but it could be due to vitamin A deficiency. But the most likely cause, and particularly if you knew that aspergillosis had occurred in this flock previously, the most likely cause is ocular aspergillosis. It's a keratoconjunctivitis caused by aspergillus species. Intramuscular hemorrhages, subcutaneous hemorrhages, are the characteristic findings in infectious bursal disease, the virulent form. Something's amiss, pardon me. Late in the stages of infectious bursal disease, the virus affects not only the bursa, but also the kidney. The bursa is shrunken, and the plica, or folds, in the bursal mucosa are necrotic. The kidneys here, the tubules are, are uh, quite pale indicating, again, a severe nephrosis. We will see the preceding lesions of infectious bursal disease in some later slides, I assume. <laughs> Pseudomembrane on the surface of the intestine. Here is the pancreas. We have the open gut and these patchy pseudomembranes. This is ulcerative enteritis caused by Clostridium colinum. Ulcerative enteritis caused by Clostridium colinum. Another form of clostridial enteritis, necrotic enteritis, occurs in birds, and it is characterized by the same type of lesion, except the lesion is confluent and not focal, such as we see here. That is caused by Clostridium perfringens. Necrotic enteritis, Clostridium perfringens, and diffuse lesion. Ulcerative enteritis, focal lesions, Clostridium colinum. The infection occurs as, uh, uh, as a sequel to coccidiosis, particularly in chickens, Imeria brunettii. The external appearance through the serosa of these lesions clearly delineated pale areas, and then a high power uh, gross photo here to show you the uh, morphology of the, of the uh, pseudomembrane. A respiratory disease in chickens, really uh, there's not much you can tell about it from the gross photograph. There would be a multitude of possible causes. In this particular instance here is one gross lesion that's caused by a respiratory disease virus that uh, we can use to make a diagnosis. This is infectious bronchitis virus. Infectious bronchitis virus, there are certain nephrotropic strains which affect the kidneys. The kidneys are swollen, in, markedly swollen in this particular bird. The ureters are markedly distended and filled with urates, and the tubules present as a pale vermiform appearance on the surface of the kidneys. This is a nephrotropic strain of infectious bronchitis virus. That virus also will infect the oviduct of the immature chicken. In this case, it has produced a cyst in the oviduct, an oviduct cyst induced by infectious bronchitis. You can also get salpingitis, in which case the oviduct will be filled with caseous exudate. And these affected oviducts persist into adult life and lead to anomalous female reproductive tracts. For example, in this one, we see an, an intact, normal functioning ovary, a normal fimbria, proximal portion of the oviduct is okay, and then we have an area that is uh, uh, aplastic, another area of aplasia, 
we have a cyst. It follows down the lower portion, the most distal portion of the oviduct is okay. Then we have no uterus. We have a hypoplastic uterus. And then, of course, the vent. So infectious bronchitis virus, when it infects young birds, will lead to persistent oviduct anomalies in the adult bird. Swelling of the foot pads and tendon sheaths in broilers is characteristic of infectious synovitis. <coughs> infectious synovitis. Infectious synovitis is caused by mycoplasma synovii. A plantar abscess or bumblefoot, plantar abscess or bumblefoot caused by gram-positive coxy. They're similar to staph, but generally somewhat different. Great big things. Gangrenous dermatitis, it's a moist dermatitis that is caused by clostridia. Clostridium. Gangrenous dermatitis, a moist dermatitis. Birds die rapidly. It occurs most commonly in birds that have experienced prior infection with infectious bursal disease virus, i.e. immunosuppressed birds. Cellulitis, and I'll orient you here. The bird's body is running along here, head to the right, tail to the left. We have the thigh, the uh, uh, drumstick coming down here. Hawk would be at the very bottom portion of the picture. We have a dry area of skin which has been reflected. We have a severe cellulitis, and this is most typically caused by Staphylococcus. Secondary to wounds, secondary to wounds. Cellulitis, Staphylococcus, secondary to wounds. Swollen facial appendages, this happens to be the waddle in chickens, is typical of foul cholera. Swollen facial appendages is typical of foul cholera. Here's another example where the waddles are affected. Foul cholera in chickens tends to be a chronic disease. Low morbidity, low mortality differs considerably from the, the uh, disease in turkeys, where mortality can be quite high. Here's infection of the external ear with pasteurella in a chicken. Infection of the sinus, pasteurella in a backyard chicken. See the copious exudate from the nostril and a small little flex of purulent material. Now this one here might lead you, and I don't know how one would sort it out, might lead you to infectious coryza caused by Haemophilus paragallinarum. Because both Pasteurella multocida and Haemophilus paragallinarum can cause a sinusitis in chickens. And I don't know of any way that you can possibly sort them out on the basis of gross lesions. Culture is the only way you can do it, and of course that's beyond uh, what we're looking at here today. Here is a case, a proven case, culture proven case, of infectious coryza caused by Haemophilus paragallinarum. I would counsel you that if you are asked, you have a chicken with sinusitis, such as this one here, and you're asked, perhaps on some examination you may wish to take in the not too distant future, <laughs> I would counsel you that you should put down infectious coryza. The reason for that being that swollen sinuses is the classical lesion for that disease. Whereas with chronic foul cholera, infected sinuses is just one of a medley of various diseases or lesions. That would be my advice. A bird that is paralysis of its right leg and paresis 
of, oh, excuse me, this is the right leg, paresis of the right leg with a contracture and paralysis of the left leg. This is the typical clinical attitude of a bird with the neural form of Merrick's disease. This is Merrick's disease, the neural form, typical clinical attitude. At necropsy, the nerve, sciatic nerve in such a bird should look something like this. It's swollen, it's rounded, it's discolored, and it's lost the nice striations that characterize the normal sciatic nerve. Please compare the color, the shape, and the appearance of the affected nerve with Merrick's disease versus the non-affected nerve. Merrick's disease occurs in several other forms, one of these being the ocular form. An example of the ocular form is shown here. We can recognize it by the asymmetry of the pupil and also by a rather clearly delineated zone of yellow-gray material in the iris, which contrasts sharply with the background color of the iris. This is all tumor tissue, which is infiltrated into the iris. This is the ocular form of Merrick's disease. Merrick's disease is caused by a type B herpes virus. A picture quite similar to one that Dr. Montgomery showed earlier today of the skin form or the cutaneous form of Merrick's disease. The feather follicles are surrounded by small raised papules or little uh, cutaneous lymphomas. This is currently the most common form of Merrick's disease that's being seen in the United States today. Some other examples of the cutaneous form of Merrick's disease can affect the skin of the shanks, the scaled portion. I didn't know this until I uh, was involved in an outbreak. Here's a normal shank and foot here for your comparison, and here's one with the cutaneous form of Merrick's disease. Basically just thickened and we can kind of see the uh, rounding up here of, this, of the uh, scaly areas where the tumor tissue is causing the scales to bulge out. Here's the same thing where these tumors, the surface of the tumor tissue is ulcerated. It certainly doesn't have the innate protective ability uh, such as what the, uh, is possessed by the scales. Here's uh, Merrick's disease involving the facial appendages. The uh, uh, comb is swollen, the face is swollen, the waddle is swollen, just generalized swelling. Now if I saw that animal, or this picture, I would think more in terms of some sort of an infectious process rather than a tumor process. I think of something like a cellulitis or something. So I don't think that you could get that, make that conclusion that that's Merrick's disease from that slide. And I certainly wouldn't expect you, nor would I think anyone else would expect you to do that without more information. The visceral form of Merrick's disease is probably uh, historically, the most important and the most common. It can affect any tissue in the body. Here we have, and I'm going to just go through a bunch of these relatively quickly. Here we have tumors affecting the serosa of the intestines. Here we have tumor tissue affecting the proventriculus. It's quite enlarged. So we can tell this is a young bird because here's an immature ovary. Here's involvement of the immature ovary with tumor tissue. These are all Merrick's disease now. Here's muscle involvement. You'd look at that and you'd say, well, that really looks more like white muscle disease. And I'll grant you that that would be a distinct possibility. If I showed you this one, though, you might perhaps get the feeling that that would be perhaps a little more consistent with an infiltrative type of lesion because of the, the pattern of it. But again, it's anyone's uh, guess. Look at the sciatic nerves. Uh, they're exposed, and if they're exposed, well, you know people have to be looking at them for some reason. Um, and also, I would say that this one here, although we can't see it very well, does look like it's probably enlarged. So uh, that might help us. That's Merrick's disease. Now here's one that you cannot say, well, this is Merrick's disease or lymphoid leukosis or something else. Certainly you can say that this is, organ is diffusely infiltrated with tumor material, tumor tissue. And again, the poultry industry has come to our aid. 
by giving us a good handle to call this disease. This is big liver disease. <laughs> big liver disease. And it actually, in fact, would be best classified as avian leukosis complex. We cannot tell whether we're dealing with Merrick's disease or lymphoid leukosis based on this lesion alone. <coughs> and I would urge you to look at that AAAP set and also the diseases of poultry and get clearly in mind the differential features of Merrick's disease and lymphoid leukosis. Uh, it would take us more time than we have available this afternoon to go ahead and, and go through those differential features. But you can sort them out, and you should try to sort them out. Here's another one that we cannot tell what this is, because we have solitary tumors here in the liver. We've got a solitary tumor here. We've got more or less diffuse tumor involvement of the kidneys. But there's nothing here that can tell us whether this is Merrick's disease or this is lymphoid leukosis. This is simply avian leukosis complex. The fact that these happen to be solitary tumors and the previous slide showed us diffuse tumor involvement of the visceral organs is of no significance. Either pattern can occur with either disease, Merrick's disease or lymphoid leukosis. Now, we're getting into a slide where we can tell that this is lymphoid leukosis. Because we have involvement of the kidneys, here we have tumor tissue. I suspect that that's part of the liver, most of which is on the other side of the of the proventriculus. But looky here, we've got an enlarged, irregularly shaped bursa fabricius. Tumors in the bursa fabricius are typical of lymphoid leukosis. If you were shown this slide, you would be expected to answer that this is lymphoid leukosis, because that is the most likely thing for this to be on the basis of that alleged bursal tumor. Here's one of those bursas that has been opened up. We see the normal folds here. And here's one that is quite enlarged. It's got a big nodule as well as an ulcer. This is a bursal tumor. It's characteristic of lymphoid leukosis. Now, they do occasionally occur with Merrick's disease, and you've got to do some other things. But by and large, the vast majority of bursal tumors are going to be caused by lymphoid leukosis virus. I don't think I've told you what that virus is, have I? It is a retrovirus, a type C virus. It is distinct from reticuloendotheliosis virus. Okay, here's one here that you could tell if you knew what you're looking at, but it's such a horrendous example, you probably wouldn't be able to tell. This is a bursal tumor. This whole huge monstrous thing is a bursal tumor, and that is lymphoid leukosis. But again, that's almost too extreme. How about this one? Can you manage that one? Big bursal tumor. And look at the solitary tumor over here in the liver. Here's another tumor in something or other right over here. Very typical of lymphoid leukosis. This must have occurred fairly rapidly because we've had abdominal laying. The bird has a, uh, an egg out here in the abdominal cavity. I think it was broken as a result of the necropsy uh, effort. Another form of, of uh, or another lesion which can occur as a result of infection with these type C retroviruses is osteopetrosis. The normal bone is in the lower portion of the slide and an affected bone is in the upper portion of the slide. Is that a separate virus? No, it's, it's a group of very closely related viruses. And the lesion that develops depends upon the specific strain of virus, the age at time of exposure, the amount of exposure, the route of inoculation, and the strain of the chicken. So you can take a virus from a case of lymphoid leukosis, use that very same virus, and modify the conditions under which it's used and get, say, erythroblastosis or uh, myelo uh, cytomatosis, some of these other manifestations. And you're going to really have to probably catch this one in that diseases of poultry to, to really get it nailed down. Here's osteopetrosis again. That's what it looks like in the bird. Aha! 
Ah. Sorry about that, people. <laughs> Didn't mean to get you with that thing. Here's another manifestation of these same viruses. What's it look like? It probably is what it looks like. These are hemangiomas. If you want to call them hemangiosarcomas because they're multiple, I won't argue with that. They are called in the literature multiple hemangiomas. They're multicentric in origin rather than metastatic. Here's another example. The uh, previous slide showed them in the liver. Here they are in the mesentery. Same virus, same closely related viruses. Here's another manifestation of the same virus. What's it look like? You're swine people. Big, you get oriented here, this big mass right, right in the lumbar area. D does it look like an embryonal nephroma? That's what it is. I hope that's what it looked like. <laughs> Here's another one. Now this, this is a little different virus. This is real neat because there are some Roux sarcoma viruses, okay? Now Roux sarcoma viruses have been divided into groups A, B, C, D, and E. And there are retroviruses which are A, B, C, and D. So apparently the sarcoma viruses and the leukosis viruses are closely related to each other, although distinct. And this is a mixosarcoma a mixosarcoma. I doubt very seriously if you would be able to get that from just the slide. It, you can see it's pretty gelatinous type of thing. This actually was a lesion from around the kidney, and this is a lesion that was growing on his head. It's a virus tumor, viral-induced tumor, uh, mixosarcoma. But I would I would think that you could probably at least get it maybe down to the tumor category, some sort of a neoplasm. Maybe not. Maybe that's even expecting too much. I don't know. I think you saw an example of this earlier, ovarian carcinoma. This uh, must have developed quite rapidly because we've still got follicles developing, so production is the first thing to go when a bird gets sick. This bird uh, couldn't have been feeling too terribly badly, but it is laying abdominally indicating that this large tumor was impinging on the oviduct and these forming eggs were being regurgitated back into the abdominal cavity. Carcinomas tend to metastasize in birds by implantation on serous membranes and we can see all these multiple implants of the tumor. Uh, this happens to be on the dorsal side of the duodenum. The pancreas is, is buried underneath this proliferating mass of tumor tissue. Ovarian carcinoma. Other carcinomas that are common in chickens include oviduct adenocarcinoma and also intestinal carcinoma. Those are the three that you're most likely going to encounter. In fact, with the exception of, of um, the human female, the aged human female, ovarian carcinomas are more common in chickens than any other animal. Again, uh, one for the trivia board. <coughs> A large fluid-filled abdomen of an otherwise normal chicken. Upon necropsy, here's the bird's head is to the left. We see the breast uh, up here, uh, pectoral muscles. Here's the loop of the duodenum. And this is what was in the abdomen. Would anyone hazard a guess as to what that large cystic structure might be? That is the right oviduct. That is a cystic right oviduct large fluid-filled cyst in the abdominal cavity. You perhaps may recall that in the normal bird, the right oviduct does not develop, nor does the right ovary. It just has a, a left and a left. And that happens to be a right one that became cystic. Again, I don't know whether this is a lesion or not, but it's a soft-shelled egg. It can occur as a result of a number of different virus infections. It can occur as a result of calcium deficiency. And I think for our purposes, let's just say this is typical of calcium deficiency. The most likely infectious agent that would produce this would be infectious bronchitis virus. A regressing ovary, a regressing ovary. We see no tertiary follicles. We see several follicles which are shrunken and have dark discoloration, some that are apparently hemorrhagic. Uh, many of these have a, an odd pale yellow color to them instead of the nice deep orange yellow that we associate with a, a good egg. 
And we see that the oviduct here is still, has not involuted, it's fully uh, formed. And so we know that this is acute ovarian regression. Virtually anything that disturbs the physiology of this bird can induce this change. Egg production is the first thing that, that goes whenever the bird is upset. Another eye lesion. Does it bear any resemblance to those that we saw before? Would you confuse this with Merrick's disease? No. Merrick's disease involves the iris. And here we see that this is centrally located. So it's either in the posterior chamber or it's in the lens. This happens to be in the lens. This is an adult bird. And this is a cat. OK, no eggs from this one for a while. Cataracts. Let's just back up on that, make sure that we got everything on that that we wanted to. This is a cataract and a mature laying hen, and it results from infection with avian encephalomyelitis virus. It occurs in a very small percentage of the infected birds. But if you look for it, you will be able to see it in most laying flocks. I just mentioned to you about the female reproductive tract development and told you that the right oviduct and right ovary do not develop, and that is correct. In this particular slide, however, you will see that this bird has both uh, an oviduct, I think my slide, this is actually, in fact, the left oviduct on this side, this is the right, would that be correct? Maybe the slide is reversed. But anyway, the large one here is the left, and the small one is the right. Look at the gonads. On the right is just a solitary, pale, white, regularly shaped mass. And then on the left is a mass that is yellow and white. Now, this is an extremely interesting condition. And I'm probably spending more time on it than it's worth. This is a triploid chicken. This bird has three sets of chromosomes instead of two. And when that happens, it becomes an intersex. Becomes one part female, two parts male. And what this is, this is an ovotestis on this side. And this one over here is testicular tissue. It actually, in fact, goes ahead and differentiates and produces, produces spermatozoa, but of course there's no delivery system here. So it's not gonna go anywhere. But this is a triploid chicken with an ovotestis and a development of the right oviduct. I never knew that animals with three sets of chromosomes would actually live and develop into anything. But, you know, anything's possible with chickens. The most common cause of loss, mortality, in laying birds is salpingitis peritonitis. What have we done with our chickens? We've bred them to do what? produce eggs. And what do they do? They produce eggs. And this constant reproduction cycle is apparently accompanied by some weakening of the sphincter that leads from the cloaca to the uterus. And there apparently is reflux of cloacal contents back up into the uterus. And hopefully it doesn't get too far up in the oviduct because that has grave consequences as far as we're concerned, with respect to the eggs that we eat. So we're assuming that it stays down fairly low, but we get an ascending infection that goes up the oviduct. And I'll show you what it looks like inside. The oviduct is tremendously distended. The wall is very thin and compromised, and it's full of caseous exudate. It's an infection, and E. coli is the most common organism that we get from this. Because of the compromised wall of the oviduct, the process spreads out into the peritoneal cavity, whereupon the process becomes fatal to the bird. I'm going to show you a couple more examples of this. Here's another one. This is accompanied then by a large cyst formation. And here's a big mass in the oviduct. This is what that mass looks like if we open it up. And we see here there is an egg in there. And there's this exudate. And then here's another egg that was going to form. See that white line right along there? So we get this laminated appearance 
of egg, exudate, egg, exudate, egg, exudate, goes on and on until the whole process breaks out in the body cavity and the bird dies. Salpingitis, peritonitis, the most common cause of mortality in layers today. Here's probably the second most common cause. Can you get oriented in this one? It's a little bit difficult, isn't it? The bird's head is to the right. The heart is here. And we see the liver. And then there's all this red stuff here. And then it's just a mass of fat in the abdominal cavity. This is fatty liver syndrome. Again, rescued by our poultry friends. You know, it's not Frederick Kuchenheimer's syndrome or something like that. It's fatty liver syndrome. It's very clear, very easy to understand. Get a big fat liver, the liver ruptures, and the bird bleeds to death. Quite simple. What causes it? Probably just our modern management. High energy diets. The birds are on high energy to produce eggs. If for some reason they happen to go out of production, they still get the energy. They're in a little tiny cage. They don't get any exercise. The fat builds up everywhere. You see the mass of fat here. There's also good evidence that suggests that these birds may be hypothyroid. The microscopic lesion is one of reticular lysis. The normal reticulum in the liver has been lost because of a lytic process. So there's, there's some biochemistry going on in there too. Fatty liver syndrome. Uh, this bird is oriented the opposite direction to the one that we just saw. His head is off to the left. Here's the heart. Heart looks a little pale. Maybe perceive a few little pale areas here. May or may not be significant. But certainly there's something wrong with the liver. Something wrong with the liver. And probably the most blatant uh, lesion, as far as we can tell right here, is this one. Sharply delineated, squared off thing. This is an infarct. And these actually are infarcts, too. They're not quite as well uh, described or uh, portrayed. If we could see the spleen, which we can't, I don't have a slide to show it to you, there would also be infarcts in the spleen. This is streptococcosis. Now, this is the same slide I showed you earlier and told you about erysipelothrix in turkeys. This is chicken, and this is strep. But it's the same, same liver, I mean, same heart. But in chickens, it's strep. In turkeys, it's erysipelas. And if you want a model, don't fool around with possums. <laughs> Grab yourself some chickens and put some strep in them, and you'll get beautiful lesions. I've done it. But don't use young chickens. I've used two-week-old chickens. I got absolutely nothing. I used layers, and, and I think I got 40% of the birds developed lesions within two weeks. So if you want a good experimental model of vegetative valvular endocarditis, you don't have to fool with possums. You can, you can use chickens. They work great. And if you're interested in that, just give me a call or drop me a note, and I'll try and help you out. Here's, a, here's one that would be a little bit hard to sort out. We can see we've got a bird. It's been opened up. Head is off to the left. Something's wrong with the liver. Something's wrong with the spleen. And as we look down the intestines here, well, there's something here. Maybe not too terribly distinct. Here's something, here's something, here's something, here's something in here. This is tuberculosis. And you're going to have to sort this out from the tumors. If you could actually see and look at this bird, it would be no problem. Because these lesions in the gut are actually ulcerative lesions and not proliferative lesions. But the thing that I go on on TV is most of the lesions have a yellow cast to them or yellow appearance to them, and they are of all different sizes. You see, we have a large one here, and then we have some little tiny ones in there. And this triad of liver, spleen, intestine is the typical pattern for tuberculosis. The lesions begin in the intestine, and then they metastasize to the spleen and liver. Now, in leukosis, which is what we would potentially confuse us with, the triad is a little bit different. Yes, liver, yes, spleen, but kidney is where the tumor occurs. 
in leukosis, in Marek's disease. So in the tumor conditions, it's kidney, liver, spleen. In tuberculosis, it's gut, liver, spleen. The vent of a chicken, I'm not exactly sure where it's at. Uh, this is mite infestation, mite infestation. How do you know when the bird has too many mites? <laughs> Pale bird syndrome. Again, poultry industry. Thank you. Normal shank, bird with pale bird syndrome. This is the unknown cause, but there's, uh, it's believed to be due to a real virus, real virus. It's a malabsorption, malabsorption problem, and the xanthophyll pigments, the lipid-soluble yellow pigments, are lost out of the gut and not picked up and deposited in the tissues. If any of you have seen Frank Perdue on TV, then you know about pale bird syndrome, right? <laughs> you don't have to look at it. It might be OK to eat. Here's a Purdue chicken, and here's everybody else's chicken. <laughs> no, I'm serious. There is a pale bird syndrome. The birds are stunted. And the characteristic feature is that they do not deposit xanthophyll pigments in the tissues. This is long bone distortion, or we used to call it porosis. Porosis, caused by nutritional deficiencies, particularly some of the B vitamins and manganese. Dissecting out those bones, this is what they look like. Get that thing to focus a little bit. You see, we've got a tibial tarsal bone, it comes down, it's in good shape until it gets right to the distal end whereupon it angles. And depending upon whether it angles in, which gives us the varus malformation, or angles out, which gives us the valgus uh, malformation, um, it just depends. We wind up in either case with malformed legs. This is a very common problem in the poultry industry today. The etiology is unknown. We're going to move on then and look at a few things that occur in birds other than domesticated birds. First of these is a lesion in a swan. And it's a not a good picture, I apologize for it, but we have a round hemorrhagic disc lesion in the gut. This is typical of uh, duck virus enteritis or duck plague. It's a herpes virus infection that occurs in waterfowl. It causes a lesion because of massive lymphocytic necrosis. In swans and geese, the lymphoid tissue along the gut is located in discs. In ducks, it's located in circular bands. The same swan, the cloacal area, the cloaca, the bird's end would be often here someplace. Uh, the cloaca is covered by a thick diphtheretic membrane because of the massive necrosis that's occurred in the underlying lymphoid tissue. This used to be an exotic disease, but it came in because of uh, migrating waterfowl and has killed hundreds of thousands of waterfowl in several outbreaks in the last 10 years. Highly lethal infection. Another highly lethal disease in migrating waterfowl is foul cholera. In turkeys, remember we talked primarily about the subacute respiratory form and the chronic uh, polyarthritic form. Well, this in uh, waterfowl, pasturella tends to produce either the peracute form of cholera with no lesions, or it produces the acute septicemic form of the disease, which is characterized by multiple foci of necrosis in the liver. You perhaps can uh, get some feeling that there may also be an acute pericarditis, and there is. Me and, a, and another fellow looked at, at a representative sample of 10,000 snow geese in a refuge in uh, Iowa about four years ago that died because of foul cholera, about a 10-day period of time. Devastating illness in uh, migrating waterfowl. So focal areas of necrosis in a duck or a goose in the liver, think of foul cholera. 
In commercial decks, this is uh, the lesions that we see are a fibrinous pericarditis. We see a fibrinous membrane covering the surface of the heart. And if we could see the other serous membranes, they would also be covered with the same serous material. This is new duct disease, which is not new anymore. It's caused by Pasteurella anatopestifer, which probably isn't Pasteurella anymore. But it is today for us, both new and both Pasteurella. Here's a close-up to show you that fibrinous pericarditis. Basically what this is, this is a fibrinous polycericitis, new duct disease caused by Pasteurella anatopestifer. Now here's, a, again, a polycericitis, and in this case it's more fibrinopurulent. Fibrinopurulent. And there are three bacteria that can cause this lesion. No way to tell them apart grossly. Pasteurella, Pasteurella mopacida can cause this. Salmonella can cause this. E. coli can cause this. So all you could be asked on this is what's the lesion, and you'd best describe this as a fibrinopurulent polycericitis. An etiologic agent would be a bacteria causing septicemia, such as Pasteurella, E. coli, or Salmonella. This happened to be E. coli. This is a commercial goose. Chronic arthritis in a commercial goose. Another range of choices for you. This one happened to be erysipelas, but uh, I would not be adverse to foul cholera. I think those would be the two main ones, cholera and erysipelas. Here's a young gosling. Infected yolk sac down here, you can see, opened up, purulent exudate, salmonella infection. Not unlike what we saw with turkeys and chickens, others. Omphalitis. Here's a big fat mess. Wish you could smell this slide. I can smell it up here even. And that took true dedication to post those, or stupidity. <clears throat> this is salpingitis peritonitis. There's a large goose egg in there. It's gotten stuck in the disease process. You can see it's covered with exudate. This is E. coli, another ascending infection in the goose. Salpingitis peritonitis due to E. coli. What's your diagnosis in this duckling? I'll draw your attention to this change right here. I don't hear anything. I'll give you a high mag of the lesion. Aspergillosis. Yes, very good. They're ready for the quiz, Doc. <laughs> this, this duckling here could not raise its head. It couldn't stand up. This one couldn't stand up. There's no gross lesions, so I couldn't show you anything. Probably shouldn't even have this one in there then either, should I? This is botulism. The only thing that you might see is you open the crop up and you might find some maggots. An emaciated, free-living goose that was picked up by a concerned citizen, brought to you for therapy. Uh, being a pathologist, you said, well, I, if I kill it, I can tell you what its problem is. <laughs> That's what I tell all my chicken and turkey clients. If you get sick, don't go see a vet. Uh, yeah. The things that we see here, the esophagus is flaccid, distended, and filled with feed, grain that we can see. The proventriculus is dilated, distended. There's been presumably an atony of the proventriculus and esophagus. This is typical of lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is a tremendous problem in waterfowl in this country today. And I just think, I hate to say it, hunters, but we're going to have to go to steel shot. There's no way around it. Okay, this one's a little bit dark. I'm gonna try to darken that room down just a little bit more. Let's see if, I hope I don't mess things up. Anybody got any ideas on this one? Proliferative growth here around the nostril. Maybe something on the eye. Gosh, this is a greedy group. You want more help? Here's the feet from that bird. Got little 
nodules here. And I know there's those people that work just with lab animals and say, well, I don't know anything about these, they're just lab animals. But I saw a slide this morning in Dr. Uh, Montgomery's collection that looked just like that, except the lesions were stuck on, I think it was a mouse. This is ectromelia in quail. <laughs> okay? This way you got to start thinking. This is pox, quail pox. And pox diseases are always characterized according to the species that they occur in, except for human pox, of course, which isn't caused by a pox virus anyway. Sick quail, gone to vet. This is what vet did. <laughs> we see lesions here uh, through the serosa, focal lesions. Open them up in the mucosa, and they're ulcers. We have yellow areas in the liver. The impression smears of these, and we get a gram-positive uh, bacillus with subterminal spores. This is ulcerative enteritis or quail disease. We looked at the lesions in some chickens earlier. It's highly lethal in quail. 100% mortality is not unusual. Small, these are ulcers. They're actually necrotic areas in the wall of the, of the intestine. Dr. Montgomery showed you a beautiful picture of this this morning. Uh, this is simply a trachea, and we can see there's something red inside of it. We open it up. And there's our syngomous trachea, the Y-shaped worm. He is, uh, his showed the more advanced lesions where you get the nodules on the outside of the mucosa. This one's very easy to catch here. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if they were all like this? You open the crop up and there's a little card saying. <laughs> Diffuse thickening of the crop, and one would have to distinguish this from crop mycosis, but you don't get near this, the uh, pseudomembrane formation with uh, capillary infestation in quail, such as you see with uh, crop mycosis. Okay, how about this one here? This probably is a little bit, definitely a conjunctivitis, right? Okay, this is parrot pox. Parrot pox is a highly lethal form of pox. Uh, mortalities, again, can approach 100%. Canary pox is a highly lethal form of pox virus in birds. Quail pox, usually mortality is 50 to 75%. It's pretty important, too. The others are much less important. This is a parrot, and uh, perhaps you cannot see it, but the liver is enlarged, and there are some small tail areas which are suggestive to us of, of uh, necrotic foci. There could be any of a host of, of uh, septicemic organisms that could cause this. Uh, the one I would be thinking of straight off the bat is chlamydia, but this is not chlamydia. This happens to be a salmonella infection. The focal areas of necrosis, all you could say would be a septicemia, septicemic process. Um, another possibility in a cytosine would be Pacheco's disease. And if it happened to be a love bird, even another possibility might be microsporidia. So, but I would think chlamydia. In fact, my approach to companion birds is if they're sick, it's chlamydia until proven otherwise. And surprisingly, about two thirds of the time, I'm right. Some canaries that died as a result of a large outbreak. This is the distended duodenum sticking out down here. And we can see these marginal areas of necrosis on the liver. The liver here is quite enlarged. Got hepatomegaly, and again, a large area along the border. We can surmise that this is probably areas of necrosis, maybe even infarction. There wouldn't be any way to really tell what this is based on the growth alone, except that this is some sort of a septicemic process, or a, a systemic process, I should say, because it's not a septicemia. This is Lancasterolosis. Lancasterolosis. Now, what can we hang that on? This would be a systemic coccidiosis infection. Systemic coccidia infection. 
The organism basically has a coccidial life cycle, except that reproduction occurs in all the body tissues, not just the gut. Lancasterolosis. We have here some focal lesions in the pectoral muscle and a similar one here on the border of the spleen. This is a parakeet. Head is off this direction. Foot is right here. Uh, some high power views of the lesions. There's the pectoral muscle lesions, the one in the spleen. These are uh, uh, definitely raised, so this suggests to us that there's something forming that. There's got to be some structure to it. So it probably is some sort of a focal, focal in, uh, lesion, maybe due to some sort of inflammatory process. This is a, a candida albicans infection in this bird. It's a systemic candidiasis. There's no way you could tell that from this, but I think you should get it down to the point where it's probably not a neoplasm, although you can't totally rule that out, but the distribution here just isn't quite typical for a neoplasm, and it does look like it's perhaps some sort of an inflammatory lesion. So maybe a focal splenitis or maybe a splenic abscess, maybe a, a pectoral muscle abscess, and then from then on it's anybody's guess as to what the the etiologic agent may be. Here's one I would like for you to get. Visceral gout, exactly. Visceral gout, this white, chalky material, crystalline in the serous membranes. And what, what organ would we look at? Kidneys, because that's where the primary lesion would be. This is just apparently a, a way in which it's an excretory pathway for the bird. If it can't put the urates outside, it's got a place to tuck them away inside. It's kind of a nifty little arrangement. Okay, here's a little growth here on the eyelid of this pigeon, and I apologize for this slide. This is truly a gross path slide. <laughs> a decapitated pigeon. This is pigeon pox. Pigeon pox, little growths on the eyelids, around the edge of the, the uh, mouth, beak, Right around there, always be thinking of pox in birds. Salmonella typhonurium, or paratyphoid, is the disease in pigeons. We have nodules in the mucosa, which show up through the serosa. We have nodules here in the uh, pancreas, nodules in the um, liver, and I don't know where else. We probably have them several other places. Uh, if I was looking at that, I'd probably be thinking in terms of perhaps something along the lines of, of tuberculosis or something. But what these are, these are actually typhoid nodules. They're little pyogranulomatous foci distributed in the tissues. Here's another example from that same outbreak, and you can see the exudation into the serous membranes. We have here again a polycerositis, and that's just typical of a septicemic disease. And if you're going to take a wild stab in birds, salmonella is about as good as anything. E. coli is great for, for young broilers and young turkeys. For older turkeys, uh, pastorella is the, the one we want to go with. Now here is a characteristic lesion of paratyphoid, or salmonella, not pylorum, not salmonella gallinarum infection. This is what's called a wing boil in the trade. This is a, a swollen joint. And this is a characteristic lesion of paratyphoid in pigeons. It may occur in the wing joints, it may occur in the leg joints. It generally is sterile. Apparently the organisms come, they initiate some sort of process, they die off in the meantime, but the process continues to develop and we have this arthritic condition. Pigeon, diphtheritic membranes, and the oral cavity, over the tongue, little ulcers in the mucosa of the esophagus. This is trichomoniasis. Trichomoniasis. I think there are lights. Let me turn the chip over. I'm not going to tell you what the diagnosis of this is because I want you to tell me. Somebody, anybody. 
What's the bird? Looks pretty nice in the picture, doesn't it? It's kind of a pretty thing. I can see why the guy imported them in. What are the lesions? Okay, eye, right here. Any tongue, right here and here. And what's the disease? Pox, that's right. And what kind of pox? Starling, Starling pox. <laughs> Absolutely. You're all ready for tonight. Now, we're going to depart from our going through different groups by ages and so forth, and we're just going to kind of look, and I'm going to kind of run through these rather quickly. Upper respiratory disease in a young turkey, we've got uh, exudate from the nostrils, brought the exudate from the eyes, typical of bordetellosis. Typical of bordetellosis. This is what the tracheas look in bordetellosis, and I apologize. This is the only histopath that I brought along. But it's, it is a subgross, so I hope that it's gross enough for you. Here's a control, and then here's the collapsed tracheas with incomplete tracheal rings. This is a Giemsa stain. This organism apparently causes a chronic tracheitis, a process very much like atrophic rhinitis in pigs, and we get dissolution of the cartilage rings, and the, the uh, trachea then collapses. We have uh, membranes being formed on the surface as a result of inflammatory processes, and the bird then dies because of tracheal collapse and occlusion. That's bordetellosis. Now, you may see a gross picture of a collapsed trachea from a turkey, wherein you'd want to say that's bordetellosis. The disease? Pox? Dry pox? The disease? Pox, dry pox, bad dry pox. The disease, pox, uh -huh. this is, the old name for this was avian diphtheria. Now, wasn't that a great name? And this bird obviously died because of occlusion of the larynx. The disease, proliferative lesions going down the trachea, pox. The disease, pox. The disease, I'm going to fool you in a minute. The disease, pox, wet pox. Sick chicken, looks like coccidia, but it's not. This is what it is. It's infectious bursal disease. Here's the slides that were out of order. See the swelling of the kidneys and how prominent the tubules are? And look at the bursa. It's edematous. We can see the glistening appearance of the surface. And then it's markedly hemorrhagic. And I know food pathology is not good, but to me it looks like a Bing cherry. <laughs> a little bit later on, our bursa is shrinking up. It's getting this off yellow color. Look at what's happening to our, our uh, kidneys up here. Pale tubules, nephrosis. And uh, we open that up and we begin to see early necrosis of those folds. And then if you can recall back to the slide that I showed you that uh, uh, was the end result was, severe. oh, here it is again. I guess I just got those others tucked in the wrong place. Here's severe bursal necrosis and the kidney changes that we talked about earlier. That's infectious bursal disease. That is the single most important infectious disease in broilers today. Every broiler gets it, and nobody knows what to do about it. Fibrinohemorrhagic tracheitis is the lesion that is typical of laryngotracheitis, a herpes virus infection. I want you to remember it as IBR in chickens. Everything is the same except it doesn't cause abortion. <laughs> Bloody droppings from a uh, eight or 10 week old turkey, nice doing turkey. Bloody droppings. We look inside, here's the duodenum filled with blood, enlarged spotted spleen, these are the typical characteristic lesions of hemorrhagic enteritis in turkeys. Hemorrhagic enteritis in turkeys. It's caused by an adenovirus, a type 2 avian adenovirus. Just real quickly, once again, since we haven't seen this one before, bloody droppings, hemorrhage in the duodenum, enlarged spotted spleen. In pheasant, the spleen has larger spots, and it's called marble spleen disease. But it's the same thing, it's just in uh, 
pheasants. So turkey with uh, CNS signs, this is meningitis due to foul cholera. Meningitis due to foul cholera. Here's some foul cholera pictures that I want to share with you. Note the pericarditis, the hyperemia, prominent blood vessels, small amount of exudate in the pericardial sac. Here's our liver, it's enlarged, it's got some faint modeling to it, maybe even a few pale foci along the borders. Septicemic form. Here's spleen from such a bird. Uh, what else do we see here? The infectious nephro or toxic nephrosis due to uh, foul cholera, swollen kidneys, prominent tubules. We even have a few little pale spots in here, which are probably, again, little areas of necrosis. We've got excess urates in the ureters, all very typical of a nephrosis. Oh, look at our adrenal here. Looks like we've got actual necrosis right in the adrenal. How neat, I've never seen that in this slide before. There it is. Wow. Okay, here's another one. Foul cholera, we can see the, just the edge of the liver, that'd be hard for you to pick up. Uh, but there's spots all through that liver. They tell you that this, is, this was a goose, but in fact, it's the same goose we saw before. Uh, the spleen is moderately enlarged, but not terribly enlarged. And we began to pick up a little bit of air sacculitis out here, a little bit of exudate. We're starting to get a polycerositis, but the bird died before it really developed. Foul cholera, again, acute form, hemorrhages in the proventriculus, little areas of necrosis. You couldn't really tell that from this slide. Just interesting. Here's more typical uh, lesions that we see in foul cholera. Here's the heart. Uh, we can see that we've had a, a organized adhesions on the epicardium. The liver over here doesn't look too terribly bad. Uh, we see a lung down here, which doesn't look too terribly bad. But we begin to look up here. Here's the cervical air sac. And we see this inspissated exudate. This is typically what happens to exudate in the birds. It inspissates. It's not liquefied like it is in mammals. And look at this lung over here. There's a large area of old necrosis in this lung. And I don't know what that thing is right there. Probably a massive purulent exudate that's organizing. Thickened air sac. This is chronic cholera in turkeys. What happens is, if this bird had not been treated, it would have run the normal course of the disease and died. What happened, it probably was treated, whereupon the disease cycle was interrupted and then these areas of, of damaged tissue went ahead and underwent necrosis. The exudate that was present in the air sacs and in the uh, uh, pericardial sac went ahead and began to organize. More foul cholera, good pericarditis right here, some purulent exudate as well as fibrinous material. Here's the liver, doesn't look quite right, but we can't say anything definitively wrong with it. Here's exudate and air sacs again. That lung, well, anytime you see that lung, they're talking about turkeys uh, with this fibrinoprelent material involving the pleuritis, uh, pleuritis. You definitely want to be thinking of foul cholera. Breeder hen, that's all that's left of the lung. It's an old cholera lesion, just big areas of necrosis. See, we don't, get the, we don't get the cavitation that we get in mammals because the exudate's never removed. It's just walled off, and it forms the focus of a granuloma. So we don't get the cavitation. We just get these big areas of necrosis in there. Let's see. I think we might have seen this one before. In fact, we did. That was cholera. Here's a chronic cholera in a chicken. This is one that's causing a keratoconjunctivitis. Keratoconjunctivitis. That's chronic cholera or atypical foul cholera is another term. It's just a manifestation of, of cholera. See the good dripping here? Ugh. Here it is in the outer ear. Otitis externa, foul cholera. Pleurum disease. This gets back to our young birds again. Salmonella infections. 
And probably looking at this, your eye was caught by the liver, right? Say, for that fatty liver. And it is a fatty liver, but fatty liver is normal in a young chick and a young turkey and a young anything, because they're absorbing the yolk with all the lipid in it. What's abnormal here is the cica, coming right down here. There's some spots in which are mucosal uh, foci, necrosis, and there's some hemorrhage, some hyperemia, and this is a tiflitis. Remember a tiflitis, cecal cores, we want to be thinking in terms of salmonella. This is salmonella pylorum. Salmonella pylorum. There's no way it could be distinguished from salmonella something else. It just happens to be pylorum. Normal crop and crop mycosis. You see the rough, knobby, whitish to yellowish membrane covering crop. Should be nice and smooth like this one over here. That's crop mycosis. How about this one? Bird's head is up, up there, actually. And the bird's back end's down here, and the wing off here, and the wing off down here. This is the thoracic inlet. Crop's been opened up. What's the condition? Crop mycosis. If you answer faster, we can get out soon. <laughs> How about this one? Fatty liver syndrome. Great. Anybody have any trouble with that one? No. She's a real porker, isn't she? <clears throat> okay, this is fatty liver syndrome, and but this is not a ruptured liver. And this implies that there's some, some clotting problems here, because what this is, we're looking at the ovary, and here's the follicle that ruptured last, and apparently it ruptured crossways. It didn't rupture right down the stigma, which is this avascular area on the surface of the of the ovum and the follicle. It apparently ruptured crossways, and it, this bird actually bled to death just out of that ruptured follicle. So this is fatty liver syndrome, ruptured follicle, and fatal hemorrhage. How about this one? An acute, I'll give you the acute dermatitis, the cause, mites. Yeah, this is germanesis. Any bird that is lame or sitting around for any period of time, these mites just jump on those birds and just gobble them up. Uh, birds that are, are um, brooding, a clutch of eggs sitting on a nest, they will get just absolutely covered with these mites. Okay, this is another vent with a little area of ulceration in the skin. This is mite infestation, same series we looked at before. Here's a more severely affected bird. How about this one? These feet on the chicken. Scaly leg, it's caused by another mite, Nematocoptes. Occurs in many, many different species of birds. How about these little guys here? Lice, pediculosis. And the only thing worthy of remembering in, in uh, about chicken lice is that they're all chewing lice, they're all malophaga, and none of them are sucking lice. They're all chewing lice, so their importance is much less. How about this one here? Nits, that's right. Yeah, this is a pigeon. Pigeon with nits. How about this? Intestine, chicken, cestodiasis, just tapeworms. They don't show up very good. I don't know. I think Anyway, how about this one? We saw it earlier. Testonysis, yeah, here you go. Cecum, and here's some other variations on that. This is a chucker. See the liver and the cica? Liver, cica, histomoniasis. Here's a quail. Now this one you couldn't get from the slide, and you wouldn't be expected to get histomoniasis. This is just something, to me it looks almost like it's some sort of tumor. I'd probably, if I had to guess at this, I'd probably say leukosis. But if we had the cica out here where you could see those, uh, and we had lesions in the cica, then we could go ahead and lock that up. But that's what histomoniasis looks like in the quail. It's a confluent lesion. It's not that target-like lesion that we see in, uh, in the other birds. Now here's a turkey. Uh, it's hard to see here, but this is a tremendously enlarged congested spleen. It's uh, at least as big as the stomach or bigger. We have a liver with uh, discoloration, dark color to it. Basically nothing else. This is acute septicemia. 
due to E. coli. And there's no way that you could tell what the cause was without, I mean, you could say it's septicemic because of the big spleen, but you wouldn't know that it was E. coli, except if it's a young turkey. Anything that's septicemic in young turkeys, something under about eight weeks of age, it's almost invariably E. coli. Almost invariably E. coli. After 12 weeks, it's almost invariably cholera until you get up to about 18 weeks, and then you can start potentially picking up erysipelas. But erysipelas is very, very uncommonly seen. Okay, here we have a series on E. coli, polyspherocytis, fibrinoperulent, good pericarditis, young turkey, uh, air sacs, uh, capsule over the liver. Here's a heart, pericarditis. This is acute. You see the nice examples of hyperemia. Look at those little teeny vessels. Here's more typical of what you see. That would even put a good hardware case to shame. Here's another one. Here we've got bile stasis. This bird's not been eating. You got exudate, pericardial sac, and serous membranes. It's all E. coli. Young birds, young broilers, always think of E. coli with these lesions. Here's pneumonia, some exudate in the pleural surface, lungs totally consolidated. Young turkey, E. coli, older turkey, foul cholera. Toxic ne ne uh, nephrosis due to the E. coli septicemia, swollen kidneys, and accentuated tubules. What's the sex of this bird? It's a female. Here's the immature ovary right here. Okay? You'd probably call that blackhead, right? Yeah, it looks very similar to it. And there isn't any way that you could distinguish it. You can't see the cecum, so you really don't know. This actually, in fact, was a multifocal hepatitis caused by E. coli. But you couldn't sort that out. If, 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 if I gave you an, ex, uh, an exam and, and put this slide on there, I would expect you to answer blackhead, even though that's not really what it was, simply because that's what it looks most like. Ooh, good purulent arthritis. E. coli, after the septicemic phase, hits the joints, then hits the bones. It's probably operating right there, right now, if we just knew it. Panoptolemitis, such as we saw with Arizona, also occurs with E. coli. In fact, if any of you are, are working with experimental eye pathology and you want to model a panoptolemitis, I've got an E. coli isolate that produces 50% panoptolemitis in injected chickens. Be more than happy to, to get you going on that. Here's one that I don't think we talked about the whole time. I apologize for that. Uh, this is a little difficult to get oriented on. The shank is down here. This is the drum that we're actually looking at. And the thing that we see, and the feathers apparently have been plucked here, we have this green discoloration, which indicates to us old hemorrhage. And as we dissect this out, we actually find that we've had rupture of the flexor tendons. Rupture of the flexor tendons. And this is viral arthritis. Viral arthritis. It's caused by real virus. Rupture of the flexor tendons in chickens does not occur in turkeys. Rupture of the flexor tendons in chickens is characteristic of viral arthritis caused by real virus. What's the problem here? Okay, gangrene, dry gangrene of the tips of the comb. I don't know what caused it. In this country, it, it's caused by frostbite. This picture was taken in Nigeria, so I know that that wasn't the cause. <laughs> How about this one? Any ideas? It's turkey, actually. It's a young turkey. This one, you really have to sort this one out. Let me just tell you, so we can get moving along here. This is just burns. Bottom of his feet are burned. And what has happened, you know, uh, turkeys and chickens are started under brooders. 
which are large aluminum pancake shaped things with a little heater in the middle of them. This crazy bird jumped up on top of that thing and sat up there and burned the bottoms of his feet. That's why I say, don't panic when you come across these bird problems. A lot of them are just common things that you can sort out. How about this one here? That, lo that looks real serious, doesn't it? Big swollen neck, big swollen head. There he is. Big old subcutaneous emphysema. Poke a little hole in his skin and let the air out, and he'll go right back to normal. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, this is caused by a ruptured air sac. Somewhere along the line, an air sac is ruptured. Air is leaked out underneath the skin and just caused the skin to balloon out. The common name for these are called uh, windbags or puffballs. <laughs> I think Dr. Uh, Montgomery also showed you an example of this. Uh, uh, the tissues earlier this morning. The bird on the right is the affected bird. The bird on the left was put in the picture for comparison purposes. What's the change in this bird? Pardon? This is methemoglobinemia. Yeah, methemoglobinemia. I don't know what caused it, but he sure was, sure had the methemoglobinemia. This is a normal one over here. This, this again is an Easter chicken here. This is a chocolate chicken. <laughs> How about this little guy here? Pardon, rickets? No. He's got an egg tooth right there. I'll just give you a little clue. Just hatched. Uh, he's, there's no eye. This is anophthalmia. There's no eye. He does have one on the other side. And not only that, there's no maxilla either. And if you don't have a maxilla, and that's probably the primary lesion, then the eye doesn't develop because the, the eye develops as a result of the no, it's the other way around. The eye develops and then the bones develop around the eye. And so if the eye isn't there, which is the basic lesion, then the bones of the face, the facial bones don't develop. And so they, you wind up with these cross beak birds with no eyes. Now some of these are in fact micro ophthalmia if you want to get real, real uh, uh, accurate about it because there, there is a rudimentary eye back down underneath there. But for our purposes and grossly, these are anophthalmia. Again, if anyone's interested in these, I can get you all kinds of them. They're very, it's, a, it's a fairly common lesion that we see at hatching. Here's another one. These don't quite make it to hatching. This is an encephalocele. Craniofacial uh, abnormalities in chicken embryos are fairly common, particularly in certain, certain crosses and, and under certain conditions. We just completed a study on those. There's vitamin E deficiency, the nutritional myopathy. There is fat in here, these white streaks. This is just the normal fat deposition in the muscle. But then these larger kind of yellowish streaks shouldn't be wiggling that thing all around. Point out definitively, that is a lesion. That is a lesion. That is a lesion. You know, you go like this. Here they are right here. <laughs> and you're going to say, you're going to say, well, that doesn't look any different than those Merrick's disease tumors that we had before, except these are smaller in a different spot. And I agree with you. I won't argue with that. Does anybody know the name of this one? Which name do you want first? The poultry industry name or our name? Poultry industry is green muscle disease. I'm not kidding, that's the truth. These are the deep pectoral muscles, pectoralis profundus, the ones that elevate the wings, and uh, they're, they're just necrotic, totally necrotic, and they're encapsulated. It's the central portion of the muscle that's necrotic. This is a very, very interesting condition. The name that we use for it, and the one that I would like for you to use, in all seriousness, is deep pectoral myopathy. Deep pectoral myopathy. This is caused, you can produce this experimentally in older turkeys by putting them on their back and letting them flap their wings. 
And after they do this for a period of time, it produces swelling of the deep pectoral muscle. The swelling is so intense, the muscle is, is covered by a thick capsule, and you get ischemia because of muscle swelling. Athletes get this condition as well. Uh, and what they do to treat it in humans is they just slash the capsule of the muscle and let the pressure out. This is one that I hope none of you ever see, particularly if you're in this country, and I hope you don't see it if you're ever in any other country looking at poultry. These are the classic lesions of exotic Newcastle disease or visceral trophic, uh, velogenic viscerotrophic Newcastle disease, VVMD. They are identical to the lesions that I described for duck plague. The virus attacks lymphocytes, it causes massive necrosis, the necrosis leads to hemorrhage, the hemorrhage leads to fibrin exudation, and we wind up with these fibrinous membranes which, if bile is present, then become bile stained. What we're looking at here are just some areas of the uh, intestine. This is small intestine, and we have a dilated area with one of these lymphoid patches. Now, birds do not have true Peyer's patches, but they do have areas of lymphoid tissue embedded in the wall of the gut. This is hemorrhagic. We can see the little flecks of fibrin on it. This is cecum. Cecum. This is colon coming down here. Cecal tonsils, markedly hemorrhagic. Here's another one of those patches with a bile stain membrane on top of it. This is one that you definitely should know. I think I've got maybe one slide. Yeah, okay. I wanted to finish with this slide because Dr. Montgomery mentioned to you very early this morning that birds get nodular cirrhosis. Indeed they do. And here is the flip side of that liver with nodular cirrhosis. If I can just outline it here for you, you can see some of the nodules on it. Now, of course, it looked better on the other side, but this tells you why it developed nodular cirrhosis. Why did it develop nodular cirrhosis? Pardon? Obstruction of the bile duct. See the tremendously distended gallbladder. <clears throat> and here's the bile duct coming right in here, and it's blocked right there. There's a small transmural portion of the bile duct, which can become occluded. I found little bits of litter in that, and sometimes it's just a sort of an inspissated plug of material. And in all instances, it leads to nodular cirrhosis in the liver. So again, I'm going to wind up, and I'm going to say, any of you that are doing liver pathology, you're looking for a model of, of cholestatic cirrhosis, there's a good one. Just go in, ligate the bile ducts, and study lesions until you, you, you run out of anything else to do. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you best of luck on your quiz tonight and also in any future quizzes you may be involved in.